big news against Bob Iger. The streaming service that he made a big fuss about in order to fend off Nelson Peltz has now been blocked by a New York judge on grounds that it might be monopolistic behavior. Let's talk about that on That Park Place. Hello, I am Jonas J. Campbell, an investigative reporter for That Park Place, and here with me is possibly my future co-host here. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. I'm just joking. He's a legendary lawyer, uh, Mr. Ron Coleman. Ron, I am so glad to have you back on the channel, and I'm hoping that people have watched lots of your videos between the last one that we did and also this one. Me too. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very glad to have you here to talk about this right here. Judge Bars Disney, Warner Fox from launching sports streamer venue. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of this, this is out of Variety by Brian Steinberg here. Oh, I get it. I now understand what this image is. It's a play button on a soccer ball and it's being blocked. I, I've been looking at this all weekend and not catching what that is. Oh, it's a soccer ball underneath that play button. See, yeah. we're Americans, okay? <laughs> we're Americans and we don't have really all that much to do with soccer balls. It's, it's, that's very true. Also, this one doesn't okay. have all Variety. those little, little black spots on it that, that are the dead giveaway there. Uh, in this case, for those of you who are not aware of Venue, which is not really gotten the ball rolling <laughs> as far as uh, as marketing or popularity. It has a name, it has a price point, and it has a not set in stone launch date. It is a streaming service that uh, essentially has no exclusive content. I know from looking through some of their filings here, no exclusive content. It's only going to last for about nine years, and it will have the content of Fox, which would be Fox Sports 1, Warner Brothers, which would probably be TBS, and some selection of Disney ESPN Sports, and it would be offered alongside like an add-on for other streaming services. Oh, and by the way, it's $43 a month. This was this is at a price point that uh, many people would question whether or not they would buy that. Uh, Ron, I don't want to make any statements about your wealth or uh, financial health here, but I, I think the word I would use is I think you're comfortable. $43 a month for half of the sports channels. Does that sound like a reasonable price to you? Well, you're talking to someone who doesn't pay for any sports channels, okay? But that's really not the question. The question is whether the target audience would pay for it. And <laughs> that sounds like a lot of money. It does. For not, a, for not a lot of what you expect to get for a sports channel. But what do I know? I'm not a business expert like the guys at Disney. Look at how good they are at what they do. I'm they, just a simple city lawyer. <laughs> That's a very good point. And speaking of the uh, business habits of the Walt Disney Company here, for those of you who are not aware, this streaming service was announced along with a lot of other big announcements for the company in the fight for Nelson Peltz's proxy fight in order to get a board seat on the Walt Disney Company. This is one of the many announcements that was, I'm, I'm going to say, probably meant to keep him off the board to show motion so that they could say that they were doing things to improve the company. And Nelson Peltz's accusation was that this was announced before the term sheet phase, meaning that they don't even know how much they'll be charging each other. In some total, they would make about $800 million a year if they got 5 million subscribers in the first five years, which would be half of its uh, useful life here. It's also, as Fox Sports and TBS and Disney ESPN together, there was some accusations here. First of all, Fubo, which is a cable bundler, they buy channels from Disney and Fox and Warner Brothers. And also the sports networks that sell the content, they sell to Disney and Fox and Warner Brothers. So uh, Fubo, though, was the first one to put their hand up and say, hey, this sounds a little bit oligopolistic, or as they might say south of the border, like a cartel, <laughs> that they might be working in concert to set prices here. And uh, this U.S. District Court Judge Margaret Garnett, I'm sure no relation to Sherilyn Peace Garnett, who is the presiding judge over the Gina Carano lawsuit. I'm not confident at be, all. That, no, I'm pretty confident. That, that would be an extraordinary thing. <laughs> wouldn't it? In federal court in Manhattan, uh, they barred the three companies on Friday from launching Venue, deciding that the Fubo TV sports streaming service would likely prevail on claims that the new broadband entity would substantially lessen competition and restrain trade. Fubo launched in 2015 as a startup focused on streaming sports programming. In the cord cutting landscape, everybody knows that Fubo is the service you want if you want live sports. YouTube TV came in and offered something similar. Hulu, which is of course owned by Disney, did the same. There is a fascinating statement right here 
Fubo alleged that Venue's launch will cause it to lose approximately 300,000 to 400,000 or nearly 30% of its subscribers, suffer a significant decline in its ability to attract new subscribers, lose between 75 and 95 million in revenue, and be transformed into a penny stock awaiting delisting from the New York Stock Exchange, all before year end 2024, the judge said in her decision. Okay, the reason I have this legal expert here listening to me jabber on is for essentially one question here. And I've told him the question and he's had plenty of time to prepare. And you can talk for as long as you want, Ron, because I am here to absorb all of it, as is our audience. Does an injunction mean that the judge feels like they are likely to rule in favor of the plaintiff? In this case, Fubo. Before I answer, I just want to clarify one thing. Price fixing in and of itself is a form of anti-competitive conduct that I don't see in this article, but rather restraint of trade, which eventually leads to higher prices for consumers and a loss of consumer welfare or a reduction in consumer welfare. I'm not sure there's a price fixing allegation here. I don't, And I don't really understand the economics or the market definition. So you're not asking me about that. And thank right. you. You're asking me about an injunction. So when a judge decides whether or not to grant a preliminary injunction, the judge has to decide four things. One, whether there's a likelihood of success on the merits. Two, whether the public interest favors the granting of the injunction. Three, whether there is irreparable harm, which means that it's harm that cannot be repaired merely by the payment of money. But that tends to get a little bit amorphous sometimes. And four, the balancing of the harms. Will it be more damaging to Disney if we enjoin them? And I'm, let's say I'm wrong, or let's say it's not really clear how it's going to come out. Am I prepared to destroy the, inc- the company that I'm going to enjoin merely to prevent the other company from having a bad quarter? Now, the language that you just cited makes it very clear that the judge has obviously dealt, as any federal judge would, with all these factors. And to answer your question, factor number one, a likelihood of success on the merits. Yes, the judge says, I've seen the submissions of the plaintiff, or in this case, the plaintiff also happens to be the party, the movement seeking the preliminary injunction. They've given me evidence that is presumptively valid and that will be admissible at trial. And I've seen the rebuttal and I'm not judging the final outcome of the case, but it's the court's conclusion that there is indeed a likelihood of success on the merits. So that that one prong of the four prongs of the granting of a preliminary injunction has been met. So yes, when there's a preliminary injunction in a case, it's a pretty good bet that as the preliminary injunction goes, so goeth the ultimate case. Okay. Because the, even if the judge, even if things come out later, even if there's a more developed record that has to come out, you've already lost the judge. The judge has formed his or her view of the case, and that might not be fair. And judges really, contrary to what we see, especially in these political cases, most of them really do want to be fair, but they're human. And their initial take is usually the direction. Now, that might not be the case here because there's a lot of money at stake. And <laughs> I have litigated I have litigated cases where there was no money at stake, but a lot of pride, and some high degree of public interest in in trademark cases that have gone past the preliminary injunction stage to answer the question of whether or not there would be a permanent injunction entered or whether there would even be liability. And I have won those cases (laughs) and I've lost them too. (laughs) I I, I would love to hear more in in a case like this. And and I've alleged a little bit of this earlier in the video here. I think that Bob Iger probably put together this deal. I, I, I would imagine he's the architect here because ESPN holds most of the power in this. Fox Sports has some assets. Warner Brothers barely has any assets when it comes to sports. At this point, I think Bob Iger has done what he wanted to do, which is move the stock price a little bit while he was fighting off Nelson Peltz. At this point, I don't think he has any reason to fight to keep this uh, venue sports alive. My next question to you is, does he bear any consequence if he gives anything less than a full-throated defense of venue sports at this point? Is there anything that could be done to him by his uh, business partners in what sounds like it's going to be a soon-to-be former business venture? As we say in the legal profession, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> too many, too many factors. Too many factors. All he right. They have a contractual obligation here. He might not be on him at all. It might be on some LLC that they formed. You know, just too many things. I don't know. 
All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for being here, Ron. Uh, everybody, you need to go check out Ron Coleman's YouTube channel. He also has the Coleman Nation podcast. He has an excellent Twitter account that I am always honored when he retweets what I put out. Uh, thank which, you for the excellent content. That's what it's all about. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. I do like to retweet inflammatory things that I seem, well, sorry, I think they're perfectly reasonable. And then I find out after the fact that they're inflammatory. So um, with that being said, uh, we want to throw this to our commenters here. Uh, what do you think is going on with this venue situation? Do you think that it's goose is cooked? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Like this video. If you like this video, go subscribe to Ron Coleman on YouTube. Yes, the Ron Coleman will be linking to below. There is another Ron Coleman, but uh, you know, I have no no comment on the quality of his content. And consider subscribing to That Park Place for all the news that should be fun. Thanks for watching That Park Place News. For more information, consider checking out www.thatparkplace.com. And don't forget to subscribe, share, like, and send this out on your favorite social media accounts.